Today we're talking about the early years of World War II. World War II, uh, at least in Europe, and really on the Pacific side as well, I guess. Um, it's really a tale of two wars. The first half of World War II in Europe, starting in September 1939, goes really, really well for Germany, with very few setbacks. The second half, there's a turning point, and things start to go poorly. So today we're going to talk about that first half, at least in Europe. Uh, starting with Germans' early successes, we need to spend a couple minutes talking about the German strategy for war known as Blitzkrieg Warfare. Blitz, like in football, a Blitz, B-L-I-T-Z, Blitzkrieg, K-R-I-E-G, Blitzkrieg. Blitz means lightning, Krieg means warfare, or war, so lightning war. Dasher, Dancer, Prancer, Vixen, Comet, Cupid, Donner, Blitzer. the lightning reindeer, because it was so fast, right? So, uh, lightning warfare. Adolf Hitler gets a reputation today that he was stupid or makes all kinds of mistakes, and that's why the Germans lose the war, all right? There are going to be some disastrous mistakes that, that Germany will make, but we can't call them stupid. They certainly are looking at their past and adapting their policies for the future based on that. Germany is thinking about World War I. What kind of war was World War I for Germany? A war of attrition. Do we all know that phrase? A war of attrition. Yes, ma'am? A war of attrition? Yeah. Oh, it's like where each side tries to get out. Each side attempting to grind their enemy down, right? And, and eventually, one side will not have enough men or resources to continue the fight. That's how the war was on the Western Front in the First World War. And how did that turn out for Germany? Badly, right? Germany, in the Second War, doesn't want to get caught in a war of attrition. Because how do you win a war of attrition? By not being in a war of attrition. Hence, Blitzkrieg strategy. The war of attrition happened in World War I because in the First World War, defensive technologies were far superior to offensive technologies, namely the machine gun, all right? The machine gun in 1914, 1915 was not the kind of machine gun that even Rambo could have thrown on his shoulders and walked around mowing people down. These were stationary weapons. They were very heavy. They had to be moved by cart and horse. Uh, they had to be cooled constantly by, by water tanks. Uh, these are not things that could be carried around. They were, they were stationary fortifications. By the Second World War, machine guns could be carried. Small machine guns can be carried. All right? By the First World War, those machine guns forced armies to dig trenches. And the trenches led to, led to disastrous conditions and horrible death tolls for both sides. Germany couldn't put up with those kinds of numbers. That's ultimately why Germany would lose, right? The British blockade keeps resources out of Germany. The people in Germany suffered. The people pushed for an end to the war. And the war ultimately came to an end. Adolf Hitler never wants to get dug in in the Second World War. Hence, Blitzkrieg strategy. Because now, by 1939, the technology has advanced so much, you don't ever have to dig in. So the strategy within, within Blitzkrieg is... Let's not worry like we did in World War I, by, like we did to take inch after inch and mile after mile of territory and drive our enemy back in a constant, unbroken front line. Remember that phrase, the Western Front from last year? That line would sometimes move a little bit towards France and sometimes push a little bit back out of France towards Belgium, and it would very slowly and very incrementally move back and forth a little bit. And as the front moved, everything behind the front on the German side was German. Everything in front of the front, those were the British and the French, right? Blitzkrieg says, no, we don't have the manpower or the time nor the concern to take every inch of Polish territory. The goal is pierce into the heart of Poland, drive through Polish defenses, cut Poland in half, and start targeting their capital city, and then rain hell onto their capital with our new heavy bombers and dive bombers and fighter planes and get that capital to surrender, get that nation to surrender. This is blitzkrieg warfare. You can do it because now you've got airplanes that can fly in from above. You've got tanks and mobile artillery that can drive in below. And there can be constant communication between everybody involved in the attack via radio technology. So if you guys can associate 
the airplane technology, the mobile technology, and mobile infantry. Infantry are your foot soldiers, but now we can start moving these guys much more quickly. And all being able to be in communication with each other wirelessly through radio. That's blitzkrieg strategy. To avoid fighting a war of attrition. On a side note, we've already mentioned this, but I want to repeat it. The French, the French over here, what is their memory of World War I? Trench warfare and war of attrition. How did that work out for the French? They won at horrible costs, but they won. Because the, the Germans couldn't effectively blockade the French with just U-boats. So the French won. So in their preparation for a possible future war, the French aren't trying to avoid a war of attrition. They are preparing for a war of attrition. And they build the, the most advanced trench line ever concocted called the Maginot Line. The Maginot Line. And so you guys should recognize that border between Germany and France is the Maginot Line. I like to say to my class, the German army was preparing to fight the next war while the French military was preparing to fight the last war. And I think we can probably imagine how that's going to work out for, for both sides. There's one other advantage that the German army is going to be taking with them as they go into Poland in September of 1939. And that's that they got to do a trial run of Blitzkrieg warfare. Where do they get to do a trial run of Blitzkrieg warfare? Very good. I uh, mentioned briefly the other day the Spanish Civil War. I'm not going to go deep into it today, but in the Spanish Civil War, you've got factions that are warring down there. And one faction is a fascist faction, led by a guy named Francisco Franco. Nazi Germany and Benito Mussolini in Italy, they're going to support Franco's fascists. And Nazi Germany is going to supply arms and weapons, including German soldiers and German pilots. So they can start testing out some of these blitzkrieg strategies that they will later use in Poland. So the Spanish Civil War story is just one of Germany getting to do a trial run of blitzkrieg strategies. All right. September 1st, 1939 comes the invasion of Poland. Here we go. Blitzkrieg. We've got some uh, German planes coming in. And of course, on the ground. Of course, on the ground, we've got the tanks and the mobile infantry. And then as German planes get closer to the capital of Warsaw, the capital city will be bombarded. Another major difference between the First World War and the Second World War is the ability to and the actuality of targeting civilians. Okay? All sides are going to do it. It starts with the Germans. The Germans will bomb Warsaw, the capital. By the end of the war, Warsaw will be a shell of itself, virtually destroyed. And the hope is you make the capital, you make the civilians at home suffer so badly that they will push their government to surrender. One um, maybe misconception that people have uh, between the First World War and the Second World War, there are actually more soldiers that will die in the First World War than in the Second World War. Okay? First World War is a disaster of a war, but far fewer civilians. The, the mass of the total of the 60 million people that die in the Second World War are civilian populations. In all, and especially Poland will suffer more than any other country on a per capita basis, like per person. Poland loses almost 20% of their population throughout the course of the war. And to, to wrap your head around that, that would be equivalent to the United States if we were ever in a conflict over six years, losing about 60 million people. All right? So it, it, it's a disaster for, for everybody involved, particularly civilian populations. Do we have a question? This, this is a, the definition of total war, where nothing is off limits, nothing is restricted, absolutely. All right, so Poland, unfortunately for Poland, they can't put up much of a defense against Germany. They have a, uh, they have a massive, I forgot to change my slides up here. They have a massive frontier they need to defend. They have a massive frontier that they need to defend. You can see that Poland is almost a peninsula now, surrounded by Germany on three sides. 
And then Poland is ill-equipped militarily to, to stop the German onslaught. Remember, every German airplane, every German tank that they're rolling in, what do they all have in common? Oh, they do have radios. Do they have any old tanks? Do they have any old airplanes? No, not really, because they, they had to demilitarize, remember? They only started building a new military, uh, 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 and their air force only started being built in 1934, 35. So everything is new, everything is top of the line. The Poles, at, at points on this frontier, they will be sending cavalry back, so like soldiers on horseback, cavalry, into incoming tanks. All right, vastly undermatched for, for this invasion. Poland will fall. They will also get no support from Britain and France, outside of Britain and France declaring war. Why? Not only slow, but Kevin? Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll get there in one sec. Why, why, doesn't, why doesn't Britain and French get uh, together an expeditionary force and head over to, to Poland to help? Guzman? They, they want to protect their own, absolutely. Yeah. That requires them to rush through Germany. Yeah, are you going to go through Germany? You're going to sail through these narrow waterways and, and succumb to German U-boats? It's not easy to get over there. You can't do it. They'll drop some leaflets over Germany, some little papers telling people, hey, don't support Hitler, he's not cool. But that goes nowhere, because the people of Germany are largely in support of their leader at this point. And then you've got the reality that France spelt, spent years and billions of dollars building the Maginot Line. What happens if France were to invade Germany? What does France have to do to invade Germany? Cross their own line, march past the Maginot Line have all those great and modern and advanced guns now pointing at your own soldiers' backs, right? They're not gonna do that. If you walk past the Maginot Line, now the Maginot Line is useless. So France is not going to attack. We've already mentioned, is Germany going to attack without France? No. Nope. Yes, ma'am. How exactly do you build the wall? You, the same way you build a wall, or the same way you dig a trench, you just make it really big and really deep and really fortified. Uh, it's just a major, like the Great Wall of China thing, but built in the 1930s. Uh, so it's dug out, you've got tunnels, and you've got, you've got bunkers, and you've got storehouses all underground, and then there's only little pockets that are above ground, especially the guns. Um, but yeah, it's just mostly, it's just modern construction for the 1930s. Yeah? So they have just like normal labor workers work on the trenches? Yeah. So Britain's not going to do anything without France. Yes, ma'am? They're probably thinking, yeah, Hitler might do this. So what do you think Britain and France are going to do in the months after Hitler invades Poland? Build, 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 build up our own military. Prepare for a war that's probably going to come. These first few months of the war, after Poland has been invaded and nothing is happening on the West, we call this the phony war. The period of World War II known as the phony war. Because war is going on, but it certainly doesn't seem like war is going on. This is contrasted with World War I when the Germans went into Belgium and war was essentially nonstop on the Western Front from August of 1914 until November of 1918. In World War II, we get this weird pause at the beginning. Nothing's really happening. Some newspapers derogatively called it the Sitzkrieg warfare. While Germany is employing Blitzkrieg on the east, the British and the French are deploying Sitzkrieg. They're sitting around and doing nothing. They weren't doing nothing. They're preparing for a war, but there's uh, no direct attack. Adolf Hitler's next step. Adolf Hitler's next step is to get into Scandinavia. Scandinavia is to the north of Germany. So here is Germany now, Denmark, and Norway. Hitler wants Denmark, Hitler wants Norway. I'll give you one answer. Denmark he needs to take because it's a staging point for an invasion of Norway. Why, I'll give you a clue, because Hitler knows his history. Why does Hitler need Norway? Why does he want Norway? Yusuf. Very good. 
you're going to get far more naval ports and seaports that you can use. So you could stage attacks on the British mainland. And having access to far more seaports farther to the north also makes it harder for Britain to do what? Yes, sir? It makes it harder for Britain to blockade Germany's iron ore supply from Sweden. Very good. Remember we had in World War I, we had the British blockade. All it had to do was cut off this much water, right? Well, now if Germany can get all the way up here, Britain can't effectively blockade that much water. So Germany will be able to continue to get resources. And then Kevin threw in the other uh, part of the equation there. Iron ore resources, iron <coughs> resources from Norway to build the weapons of war that Adolf Hitler needed to, to fight. Iron makes steel. St iron, you turn iron into steel, essentially. Um, you need that for his war machine. So next step, Denmark and Norway. Next step, into France. Into France. Oh, one side note. This is Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill was the one guy in the 1930s in, in Parliament. He wasn't the only one, but he was the most vocal. Winston Churchill in Parliament in the 1930s was the guy saying that we need to stop Hitler in 36, in 37, in 38. While the majority of the British government and the majority of the population, they were appeasers. Churchill was the guy that thought Adolf Hitler was a major threat. Upon Norway falling to Nazi Germany, Neville Chamberlain has got the weight of this whole conflict on his shoulders now, and he resigns from office. Neville Chamberlain steps down. He, he leaves the uh, prime minister's office. That was in 1940. So Neville Chamberlain is now out. Parliament chooses Winston Churchill to be the prime minister. Because when now you're at war, you need a war leader to lead you. And Churchill is nothing if not a war leader. Interestingly enough, as we will just foreshadow a little bit, when, Ger when Britain wins the war, when Germany surrenders, guess what Britain does to Winston Churchill? You're out of office now. We don't need a war leader anymore. We will go back to a Labor Party pacifist kind of guy. So they got rid of Winston Churchill when they didn't need him anymore. But he's a name we're going to hear a lot throughout the rest of the years. Next step for Nazi Germany is France. And the fall of France will come pretty swiftly. Because if you're France, you remember World War I, right? You remember how that war was fought in your backyard and how disastrous it was for your country. And you're looking at what has happened so far in this war. And you look across at Poland and you see Poland tried to resist Nazi Germany and their nation was destroyed by Nazi Germany and their capital was bombarded by Nazi Germany. And then you look up in Scandinavia and you look up in the Netherlands and Belgium, which obviously Adolf Hitler's got to take first before he gets into France, and those countries capitulated or they surrendered much more sooner. All right, much sooner. More sooner. He talks like this. They surrendered much more quickly. And their cities didn't get destroyed. Amsterdam didn't get destroyed. Copenhagen didn't get destroyed. Sure, there was bombing, but it didn't get destroyed. It wasn't Warsaw. So if you're France, do you fight like you did in World War I? Or do you give in and live to see another day? And France will ultimately, after putting up a limited fight, will ultimately surrender. The fall of France, uh, we'll, we'll make one note. Uh, this is what's known as the escape at Dunkirk. As France was falling to Nazi Germany, Almost 400,000, mostly British and some French and Belgian troops, were going to be able to escape from northern France and get back to England to fight another day. This is seen as one of Adolf Hitler's early mistakes, not cutting off this escape at Dunkirk. But as Hitler had his eyes on the prize in Paris, these soldiers were able to escape into England. They'll come back to France in a few years. When Hitler takes Germany, ah, when Hitler takes France, pardon me, yes, ma'am. So Germany and France didn't even really fight at all before. No, they fought. They fought, but it was a limited fight. It was nothing like we saw in the First World War. So there was a battle for France, but it did not last very long. I'm gonna go back to our map here really quickly. 
as Germany takes France, as Germany takes France, they don't take all of France, all right? Germany, of course, is going to invade France through Belgium, just like they did in World War I, so as to avoid that Maginot Line. The Maginot Line is now seen as the most uh, ridiculous waste of uh, military resources in the 20th century, because it never needed to be used. The Germans swept around it, and the Maginot guns, they didn't turn all the way around to fire upon the German army now behind it, all right? Because why would you do that? Just have your guns face towards Germany. That's all you ever need. Almir. Country replicated the Maginot Line? It was Czechoslovakia. Okay, so they, had, they had their little Maginot Line, and that's what Germany took over so they could take a look and see how things worked and have a better idea of how to confront the real Maginot Line. Belgium had like, fortifications based on it, too. Absolutely, yes. Uh, but nothing was as large and as intricate as, as the real Maginot Line. Germany goes into France. They're not going to take over all of France. They essentially take over the northern portion of France and all of the Atlantic coast. So Nazi Germany takes over all of the Atlantic coast of France. Two reasons. One, it will provide a staging point for an eventual invasion of Britain. So you need that land so you can launch into England. Two, all along that coastline, all the way up, Germany is going to build a, a line of fortifications known as the Atlantic Wall, to stop any invasion of the Atlantic coast. And Germany wants to control that territory so they can control that wall. The south of France is still going to be under a French flag, but now with a new capital, because the old capital, Paris, is now in the Nazi-occupied France. This is going to be called Vichy France. V-I-C-H-Y. Vichy is a city in southern France. So it will be a French government led by a French president. As a side note, that French president was Marshal Patton. He was a uh, World War I hero, leader of French troops at Verdun, at the Battle of Verdun. Uh, P-E-T-A-I-N, I believe, right? Uh, with an accent in there. Uh, and he is essentially going to be a puppet leader to the Nazis. The Nazis will dictate to him how to rule Vichy France. All right? So Vichy France will still control southern France. They'll control northern Africa, the French colony of Algeria, right? They'll control Southeast Asia and Indochina, because those are French colonies at the time. So Germany doing very well. France obviously not. Why are the German armies doing so well compared to the Allies at this point? Got a couple reasons. The Blitzkrieg strategy works really well compared to the defensive strategy of the Allies. Yes, ma'am? The technology that the Germans are taking into it, absolutely. They've been planning for a war, a literal war, for years now, while Britain and France kind of were behind the eight ball to get to that point. Yes, sir? The Allies are way too slow to respond. They're expecting things to be a lot slower, like in World War I, but they weren't counting on any mechanized forces at all, basically. Excellent. So the Allies were slow to respond. The Allies also lacked any unified leadership at this point. So there was no one Allied commander dictating to French and Belgian and British forces, like they would eventually have. Whereas the Germans have a common goal, coming from Adolf Hitler to German generals, to the soldiers, right? And now England, and now England is all alone. Now England is all alone. Well, they're not completely all alone. Because by this point, the United States is starting to adapt some of our previous neutrality acts that we signed. Remember we talked the other day about cash and carry? How through our neutrality acts, we said, okay, you can still buy stuff, but you got to pay cash and you got to carry, but we're not selling weapons of war to countries at war. By 1940, we're changing our tune. And we will allow Britain to buy American weapons so long as they pay, for ca pay it with cash and as they carry it in their own ships. And then shortly after that, Congress will pass another law called the Lend-Lease Act. 
We'll talk about these more in depth on another day when we go back to talking specifically about the Americas. But the Lend-Lease Act was kind of a, a quid pro quo arrangement between the United States and Britain. I give you something, you give me something. The Lend-Lease Act initially was the United States loaning Britain, now we're loaning again, loaning Britain a bunch of old naval warships that they could use in the war effort. And in return for that, the United States would gain leasing rights on naval bases around the world. So we give them some old ships that they can use in the war. They're going to hook us up with some naval bases because Britain's got a lot of territory around the globe. And we are happy. What does it mean for American neutrality? We're not fighting the war yet, but we are absolutely on Team Britain at this point. Roosevelt, if he could, would want to fight in this war, would want to join with, with Britain, but there is no popular or congressional support to actually send American troops at all at this point. So Britain, outside of this financial aid from the United States, is essentially alone. Now we come to the next part of the story. Germany obviously wants to defeat Great Britain. It's their only enemy left in Western Europe. So to, to defeat Great Britain, they've got to invade Great Britain. And that's not easy, Tyler, why not? That was scary. I really had my heart skip a beat right there. I thought you would hold it up. Uh, why is England hard to invade, Tyler? Because they're not connected by land. They're not connected by land. What do we call something that's not connected by land? Island. It's an island. Very good. We're going to try to make our language a little more concise. So Britain is an island. It's hard to invade. To invade an island in 1940, you've got to be able to do two things. You have to, one, gain what's called air superiority. You have to gain what's called air superiority. You have to control the skies. Because if you can't control the skies, you can never do the second part of the equation, which is called an amphibious assault. An amphibious assault or an amphibious invasion. You like that, Eddie? I like duck boats. You like duck boats? Okay, excellent. An amphibious assault, just like a frog, is born in the water, but he's perfectly at home on the land. An amphibious assault comes from the sea, moves on to the beaches, and then moves on land, right? Every time enemy forces during the Second World War are going from boats to land, that's an amphibious assault. We're going to do a lot of that before the end of the war, right? Germany's got to do it to Britain to take over Britain. They've got to have an amphibious assault. To do that, they have to gain air superiority. What happens to an amphibious assault if you don't have air superiority? It'll get mowed down by enemy air force, right? You can't do it. So the first move in what's known as Operation Sea Lion, the first move, which is uh, called in Operation Sea Lion, the German plan for invasion of England, is known to history as the Battle of Britain. The Battle of Britain is an air battle over the skies of southern England. When little children were taken from their families and went to live in the countryside in creepy old mansions only to find a wardrobe in one empty room and they'd hop in and they'd go into a mystical land for the next four years to avoid the conflict uh, going on around them, right? That's why those kids were there. They, this was the, evac the children's evacuation of southern England because southern England was going to be bombed by Nazi Germany. So get your kids, if you can, to the countryside. Now, mostly this was like the wealthier people that were able to do this kind of thing. So the wealthy kids got to go to the countryside and live in some uncle's mansion or estate where he could find a wardrobe and go into Narnia for, for the next few years. And what was the whole Narnia story about? What's the theme of Narnia? It's an epic battle between good and evil, right? And that's the reality that these children were living in, right? So. They go in the, the, the wardrobe to escape war, only to enter another one. But in their story, the good guys win. The good guys win. So the Battle of Britain, it's an air battle. It's an air battle before an invasion of Germany. And during the course of this air battle, Nazi Germany would target the city of London. From September of 1940, to November of 1940, 
September 7th, 1940 to November 2nd, you don't need to know those days, just September to November is fine. The city of London would be bombarded every single night by German bombers. This is known as the London Blitz. Or just the Blitz. So if you hear someone talking about the Blitz in World War II, it's the bombing of London by Germany. This is disastrous bombing of the capital city. It's, it's terrorizing the citizens. But the citizens had the leadership of Winston Churchill talking to them on the radio, and even their king, if you've ever seen that movie King's Speech, where the king had a terrible stutter, and he had to go to a coach to learn how to speak better so he could tell the people to be calm and stay in this fight. From September to November 1940, London would be bombed every night. And then in the skies above England, the, Royal, the airplanes of the Royal Air Force were in a non-stop battle with the, uh, the fighter planes and the bombers of the Luftwaffe, the German Luftwaffe. Yes, sir? So, uh, basically, by Germany, did the city go like the Anglo-German declaration? Done. Yes, that is gone at this point. The Anglo-German declaration was done when Britain declared war on Germany uh, back on September 3rd, 1939. But now, they're, now it's absolutely shredded, right? So, now there's the Battle of Britain. Hitler, this is one of the first instances, well, beyond that escape at Dunkirk that Hitler did not call the, the destruction of, that Hitler should have probably listened to his advisors, his, his generals. His Luftwaffe commanders called for the attack of British air bases. While Hitler liked images like this far more. Hitler wanted to bomb London. Hitler thought bombing London would lead to a British surrender. His generals in the, in the Luftwaffe wanted more attacks on British air bases. They lost because Hitler wins. In the end, the British Royal Air Force wins the Battle of Britain. The German Air Force, the German Luftwaffe, never gains air superiority which means Operation Sea Lion can never proceed. There can never be an invasion of England by German forces. It's the first defeat of the Germans in World War II, and it is hugely important to our story going forward. Why, yes? Instead of air bases. And, and this is going to get into why this is so uh, crucially important. Why this is so crucially important. Uh, first of all, talk about the reasons the Royal Air Force are going to win. First, it's that disastrous choice for Hitler to bomb London rather than those air bases. Because had Hitler bombed the air bases, guess what British pilots would have had to do? They would have had nowhere to take off or land, or they would have had to use air bases much further to the north. Right? And putting them further away from the, the main set of attacks. German planes in the Battle of Britain were all flying from France or Belgium to get across the channel. While British planes were taking off right where the battle was. So they, when they got in the air, they had far more fuel, they could stay in the air much longer, and they could refuel more quickly. Yes, sir? Very good point, Kevin. If you are a British pilot and your plane gets shot out from under you, we have these visions of planes getting shot and big fireballs in the sky. That doesn't happen all the time, all right? More often than not, wings are, are shot up or tails are shot up. The plane is inoperable. So a pilot has a chance to eject. And if he's a British pilot, he parachutes down, and he's probably having a bad day. Okay, this is not fun. You might still have German fighters shooting at you. But if you land and you survive and your arms or your ribs aren't broken from the ejection, then you can get into another plane and be recycled to fly another day. But if you're a German pilot doing the same over southern England, if you survive the landing, and then if you survive your capture, you become a prisoner of war, and you never get to fly again. We also want to add one other piece of technology that's going to help the British out in the Battle of Britain, and that is, Kevin? Radar, Radar technology. Radar technology. Very good. So radar technology didn't exist or wasn't needed in the First World War. It didn't exist as well. The Germans, uh, the British knew where they were coming from. So the British at night 
Uh, they could send warnings and, air, and send air sirens or sirens to let the people know that an air raid was coming. And during the day, they could see planes coming in so they could respond to them with the Royal Air Force. In the end, the British win, the Royal Air Force wins. Winston Churchill will give uh, some of his most famous words that he ever spoke to the Royal Air Force. These are goosebump inducing words where Winston Churchill says, never in the course of human events have so many, like all British subjects, all free people of the world, never in the course of human events have so many owed so much, so much, their lives, their fortunes, their freedom, their liberty, Never in the course of human events have so many owed so much to so few. These handfuls of guys, these hundreds of guys that flew these planes for the British Royal Air Force. So the British Royal Air Force wins the Battle of Britain. Germany can never invade. But this does not mark the end of the Second World War for Germany or anybody else. Because now Hitler looks to the east. The Soviet Union. Hitler signed a Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact, or Germany signed it, in 1939. But like every agreement Germany has signed under Adolf Hitler, they're temporary. They are used for as long as they're needed, and then they're discarded. Here is another instance when Hitler is going to jump the gun compared to what his generals suggest. Hitler's generals don't want him to invade the Soviet Union until maybe 1943. But Adolf Hitler thinks the summer of 41 is a good time to go. Now first off, let's talk about why he wants to invade Russia in the first place. Yes, sir? He hates communism. Absolutely. He hates the Slavs. Absolutely. Sebastian? No longer fighting the two top wars. Very good. He, he knows the only way Britain could ever do him any damage. The only way Britain could ever strike back at Germany is if they had a major ally like the Soviet Union. So let's defeat the Soviet Union and not give Britain that opportunity in the future. All right? And he's not fighting actively on the West. The West has played it. Britain doesn't have a foothold in, in Northern Europe or in Western Europe. Hitler's building the Atlantic Wall. He doesn't have as much to worry about in the West. Kevin? This is Laban's round. This is more Laban's round than Hitler could ever need. And so he wants to go to the east. He also knows, or he believes, that the Soviet Union can be defeated and defeated relatively easy. Because the Soviet Union is proving themselves not to be a very effective military state. In 1939, we remember the start of the story, Hitler and the Soviet Union agreeing to partition Poland, right? After the Soviet Union takes their half of Poland, they are going to continue fighting and conquering territories. They will take Lithuania and Latvia and Estonia, three countries that we call the Baltic states because they're on the Baltic Sea, and they're conveniently put in alphabetical order from north to south by geographers. So Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Originally, it was going to be all mixed up, and someone said, no, let's put them in order. It makes it easier on high school students. So Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. But then Hitler also was concerned about Leningrad in the north, the former St. Petersburg. Now it's called Leningrad after Vladimir Lenin. Right across the border from Leningrad is the country of Finland. What's that? Hitler or Stalin? I, did I say Hitler? I meant Stalin. Stalin was concerned about Leningrad. Sorry about that. Stalin was concerned about Leningrad because Leningrad didn't have a lot of territory to its north that wasn't Finland. Stalin tried to work out a deal with the Finns. Hey, Finns, have I got a deal for you? I will give you some Arctic territory that's frozen for most of the year that's virtually useless to you but might have some oil under there if you give me the land around this lake around Leningrad. Finland said, no, we're not doing that. So for Stalin, it was war. So while Hitler is doing everything that he's doing in 39 and 40, the Soviets are fighting their own war. All right? We call this war between the Soviet Union and Finland the Winter War. Not going to talk a ton about it, but I want to say a couple things. The Winter War is a victory for the Soviet Union, but it's one of those victories 
that we refer to in history as a Pyrrhic victory. A Pyrrhic victory. This comes from ancient Greece. A Pyrrhic victory is when you win a battle or you win anything. But usually it's talked about in military terms. When you win a battle, but that victory is so costly, so disastrous, that it sets you up to lose in the future, or you've ultimately lost more than you've ever won. That is a Pyrrhic victory. You might be able to call it a victory, but your losses are so monumental that it certainly doesn't seem like a victory. And this is the Soviet Union's war against Finland. The Soviet Union should have steamrolled Finland. But the Finns were able to put up a defense, kind of like Belgium, think, in 1914. Put up a defense that the Soviet Union couldn't account for. Their troops, the Soviet troops, were horribly organized and horribly led. And vastly ill-equipped for the Finnish winter. They're poorly led because of Joseph Stalin himself. In the 1930s, don't need to write this right now, just hear it. We're going to hear more about it uh, in a couple weeks. In the 1930s, Joseph Stalin was absolutely paranoid that people around him were out to get him and bring him down. All right? That's kind of what happens when that's largely how you've risen to power. So you're worried about people all over around you trying to bring you down. So Joseph Stalin will usher in an era in Soviet history known as the Purge. Where, where Joseph Stalin will move to eliminate any possible political and military rivals that he might have. Through the mid to late 1930s, thousands of officers in the Soviet military will be put on show trials, what are known as show trials. A show trial is a trial where you're accused of something, but it's a show trial because we know the outcome before it even happens. We know what's going to happen. It's a show trial. And many of these soldiers and officers will be found guilty and ultimately will be executed by Joseph Stalin, which thins the ranks of military leadership for the Soviet Union. And it appoints and, and, and gives promotions to officers who have no business being promoted into positions they have no business leading soldiers. And then you're left with an officer class who are just a bunch of yes-men to Joseph Stalin. Because what happens if you don't tell Joseph Stalin what he wants to hear? You're done. So the Winter War is an abject disaster for the Soviet Union. They win, but it shows Germany that the Soviet Union is not going to be a formidable enemy. Yes? Paranoia. He was worried that there were those around him that did not support him and would bring him down ultimately. Paranoia. Very excited to announce... In a couple of weeks, uh, you guys may remember from freshman or sophomore year when we went to Wayne State for AP Day, um, you guys heard some lectures from some professors there. Uh, at every Wayne State AP Day, my student's favorite lecturer uh, is a gentleman uh, with longer hair named Aaron Reddish, who talks about Russian history. Uh, students usually remember that and, and enjoy it. Uh, he's coming here to us. He's going to come here on October 14th, and he's going to speak to us about Joseph Stalin in the 1930s, and you guys are going to be able to answer or ask him any questions that you have about anything Soviet Union, Russia, Joseph Stalin. Very excited that he's going to be coming here. It's a student development day for you guys, so it's not like you have to stay after school or anything. The morning, you get history. So for, we'll be with me first thing in the morning, and then Dr. Reddish will show up and talk more about all of these things. So you'll hear more about this story on that day. So the Soviet Union, yes, sir. October 14th. That is a student development day that you should not be skipping. I get you in the mornings. Uh, your science teachers get you in the afternoon. What's that? Yeah, you're going you're gonna to be doing something in the afternoon with, with them. Yep. I'm it, it, it's going to be in the afternoon. So, yes. No, my, I'm in the morning. He, it might be a little mixed up. Don't worry about it. I know what's going on. Um, so, you, you're with me in the morning. So, so Hitler will invade the Soviet Union despite his generals saying, don't do it. And this is a monumental invasion. It is the biggest military operation in human history. Kevin, is that still true? Yeah. Yeah, because nothing can be bigger. What are we talking, Kevin? Three million Germans going in, right? And thousands of tanks and thousands of aircraft and thousands of heavy guns. 
the Germans are going to assault the Soviet Union with the biggest military force that has ever been put together. And they will do it against Hitler's general's wishes again. They will do it in what's known as a three-pronged attack. Dividing that massive force into three armies. One that's going to march to the north to take Leningrad. One that is going to go through the center onto Moscow. And one that will head to the south through the symbolic city of Stalingrad, which Hitler really wants to take because it's called Stalingrad. Do me a favor. When you guys become rich and famous, don't name things after yourself while you're still around. Be so good, be so good that once you're gone, people want to name things after you. George Washington didn't name Washington, D.C. Um, while he was around. Other people did that. That's what you want. Joseph Stalin calls it Stalingrad while he's there. That ain't cool. Don't do that. Is Lenin called uh, St. Petersburg Leningrad? I don't know the answer to that question. I think that came after the fact. But I could be wrong on that. I don't know the answer. I want to look that up. Stalingrad, and then on to the oil fields of the Caucasus. The Caucasus are a mountain range um, down here between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. There's oil down in the Caucasus. So to the north, to Leningrad, central to Moscow, south to Stalingrad, and the oil. Hitler's general said, no! We need one coordinated central attack and take the capital. Hitler said, no, Soviet Union's a mess. We can do this in our three-pronged attack. And in the first months of the attack, the attack is launched in June of 1941. In the first months of the attack, it goes very well for the Germans. <coughs> Stalin was absolutely unprepared for this invasion. Why would he be? He had an agreement with Germany. Stalin is unprepared. And his military leadership, again, still weak and unorganized. The German Luftwaffe will enjoy early air superiority over the Russian Air Force, which is, you know, their planes are older and outdated, and most of them aren't going to get off the ground before they're destroyed by German Air Force. Luftwaffe, L-U-F-T, W-A-F-F-E. The W's in German sound like V's, and the V's sound like F's. Crazy. So Luftwaffe, uh, German Air Force. The Russian military is going to be short on most supplies. Short of weapons, short of tanks, short of transports. And then, even worse for the Soviets, as the Germans march in, a lot of Soviet citizens are going to say to the Nazis, wait a minute, you guys are going to fight the Soviets? You're going to go fight Russians? Can I join you? Let me help. Because the Ukrainians had just escaped one of the worst massacres of human history in an event known as the Ukrainian Holomodor, or Holocaust, the, uh, uh, a mass starvation of Ukrainians based on Stalin's policies. A bunch of Lithuanians are going to be happy to join the Nazis to fight the Russians, because they didn't like the Russians. Some Eastern Poles will be happy to fight the Russians, because they didn't like the Russians. So the Nazis are going to have a lot of aid from these various ethnic groups that the Soviets have taken over. Imagine how bad Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union must have been for these people to embrace the coming of the Nazis. All right? There were some Poles that actually helped the Germans. You, you have, in eastern Poland, you've got some events that are going to go down um, early on uh, in the war that, that some to this day see the Soviet Union as a bigger enemy than Germany ever even was. In Eastern Poland, we're talking. Well, let me, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Let, let's push on for now. Ultimately, though, the invasion of Russia is a disaster. Hitler fails by, con by not concentrating his attack. The geography of the Soviet Union is just too big for Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg works best in smaller, more concentrated attacks. And the Soviet Union um, is too big for that. The, the initial German advance is so fast that it's going to outpace their ability to supply themselves. So the army is going to move ahead while supplies are still lagging behind. 
allied, especially American aid, is going to be start being pushed in to, to Russia or the Soviet Union. So that will give some help to the Soviets. The, even the U.S., we start offering lend-lease aid to the Soviet Union. We'll talk more about that at a later date. Russian weather. The Germans attack too late, ultimately. And the Soviet Union is just too big. So by the winter of 1941, the Germans will be bogged down in a Russian winter. Engines of tanks and trucks will start to freeze. Men are ill-equipped for the winter, and they literally start to freeze. And then there is an effective Russian resistance. <coughs> the Russians and the Soviets employ a scorched-earth policy. This is where you literally burn and destroy everything as you retreat, leaving nothing for the, uh, the oncoming Germans to take. And not only leaving nothing for them to take, but when you burn forests down, when you burn fields down, when you destroy everything, when the rains come of the fall, when the rains come, there's nothing to soak in all that water. There's nothing to use up all that water. So Eastern, so the western portion of the Soviet Union becomes a boggy mess that tanks and trucks and men will start getting stuck in as they're making their way west. The outcome of Operation Barbarossa. Britain now has an ally. Adolf Hitler wanted to destroy the Soviet Union so he would never have to fight a two-front war. He fails. Now he's given himself a two-front war. It's the first failure of Blitzkrieg warfare. Remember, the Battle of Britain wasn't really Blitzkrieg, because that wasn't tanks and, and troops, right? And though it's a, there are many disasters for the German army, none is going to be greater than the city of Stalingrad. That symbolic city that Adolf Hitler, more than any other, wanted to take. Adolf Hitler could not get the Soviet armies in Stalingrad to surrender. Joseph Stalin wouldn't let the Soviet armies in Stalingrad surrender. The entire city, and you can kind of make it out in the background here, the entire city is going to be destroyed, but Soviet armies will not surrender. Ultimately, it will be the German troops that will be surrounded in the city of Stalingrad. And ironically enough, Adolf Hitler will not let his army retreat and surrender. And so in the end, the Battle of Stalingrad is going to leave 200,000 German soldiers dead. One battle, 200,000 German soldiers dead, with another 91,000 taken prisoner. And most German prisoners taken in World War II by the Soviets, they will not live to see the end of the war. Yeah? What did you call the operation? Sorry. Operation Barbarossa. Barbarossa. So this Battle of Stalingrad and this victory of the Soviets in the Battle of Stalingrad and Germany's failed invasion of the Soviet Union in general are seen as turning points in the Second World War. From here on out, things aren't going to go very well for the Soviet army. For the German army, thank you. Ooh, long day. Or, or both of them, yeah, they're not going well for either. But the Soviets have more men and more resources to keep throwing at the Germans. To make things worse for Germany, in December of 1941, December 7th of 1941, the Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor. The Japanese attack an American naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. The next day, the United States declares war on Japan. Within a few more days, Germany decides to keep one of its agreements. Because the United States declared war on Japan, the United States kept its what they call the tripartite pact, we'll talk about this more later, with Japan, between Japan and Italy and Germany. When the United States declares war on Japan, Germany will declare war on the United States. So if we look at the start of 1941, Adolf Hitler had Western Europe taken over, most of Eastern Europe taken over. By the end of 1941, Adolf Hitler is now fighting not only Britain, but now the Soviet Union and the United States. And now the war is going to start turning.